so I have to thank Adam Fuchs uh, in the presentation. He actually sort of set me up for the initial joke of this talk, um, which is the pun behind calling Kerberos uh, practical ever. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I've been at Hortonworks for almost four years now. Um, I've recently moved into this uh, elusive thing called management as well, which is uh, uh, yet to be seen if that's good or bad. Um, but essentially, um, I work on HBase, Phoenix, and Accumulo. Um, I got my start with Accumulo um, uh, back at the NSA, got out, and have been doing all sorts of different fun, exciting things now. Um, do a bunch of uh, mentoring stuff up in the ASF incubator as well, um, so helping podlings uh, or uh, software projects who want to join the ASF and get involved, figure out how the process works, um, all sorts of things there. Uh, the standard disclaimer here is um, all of these names here are trademarks of the Apache Software Foundation, um, blah, blah, blah. And today we're going to talk about Kerberos. Um, it is one of these things that is the bane of existence for most people. Um, some of my favorite ones are the madness beyond the, uh, beyond the gate. Um, people really like making the uh, Cthulhu references as well to this. Um, uh, one of my old favorites was black magic and voodoo, referring to it. Um, and people just often swear whether they actually mean it or not, just when they're talking about it. Um, it's a bit uh, selfish for me because um, uh, one of the earliest uh, recollections of support cases I would start getting for work were always around security. Somehow, um, I said one time that, yeah, I can look into that Kerberos issue, and it's just been downhill since then. Um, so my selfish goal is that the more times I give this talk, hopefully the more people will see it and the less cases I will inevitably have. It hasn't actually worked out yet, but I'm still hopeful. Um, so uh, because we could probably spend all day talking about different aspects of uh, Kerberos and how it implements inside of Java, how it implements inside of Hadoop, how it implements in Accumulo, uh, and down and down. Um, just set a couple ground rules of what we are going to cover today. Um, uh, we, we are not going to uh, be giving you code snippets on, you know, this is how I, uh, these are the lines I add to my Java application to make it run. We're not going to do stuff like that. Uh, we're not going to go through and list out specific error messages. When you see this, you need to check these three things. We're not going to do this. Uh, the, the goal here will be that uh, hopefully I can provide you some basic primer to understanding what Kerberos is actually meant to do. Architecturally, how does it work? And um, this is sort of the approach of how I've learned uh, how all this stuff works. It's just the high level thing of once you understand what is the system actually trying to do, it removes that sort of ambiguity on saying, I don't know what to do about this error. And you can get some good pointers to say, okay, I should be looking at, I should look at this, and that usually uh, enough of a kick to put you in the right direction to figure out uh, exactly what is causing your problem. So uh, Kerberos, uh, besides being a three-headed dog in uh, mythology, uh, Greek, Roman, anyways, um, is a network authentication protocol. Um, so we're talking about here, um, how does one system know that another system is who they say they are, right? Uh, it's based on uh, some uh, secret keys, some public key cryptography. So you have some private key um, that, is, uh, I, that identifies you uniquely, and you're uh, comparing that against some other server so you know that they are who they say they are. Uh, the most common implementation that you'll probably run into is uh, known as MIT Kerberos, obviously coming out of uh, MIT. Uh, Heimdall is another one that you may run into. Uh, this is uh, for everybody who has their Apple laptops out. This is what is actually coming pre-installed on your machine. Um, uh, in theory, they are perfectly equivalent, equivalent to one another. You should be able to use one when you use the other. But in practice, uh, whenever you see Kerberos, people are 99% uh, uh, of the time saying uh, they mean MIT Kerberos. Um, and the other sort of point here is that uh, is a, a network authentication protocol, right? We're not talking about authorization at all here. So we're only, uh, Kerberos helps us answer the question, who is this person? Are they who they say they are? We're not trying to answer the question with Kerberos, what is this user allowed to, to do? So uh, the first sort of uh, piece that you have when you're going to install Kerberos is you would have a KDC. Um, so the uh, key distribution center, which is a uh, monolithic server that you'd have installed in your cluster. This can scale up to tens, hundreds, thousands of nodes that can, uh, it can service. And it is the source of truth to say, um, is this person who they say they are, essentially. 
Um, so they are the, the, quote, the trusted third party. Um, so they are also very important when it comes to actually saying, how do I secure uh, my Kerberos installation? The KDC is one of those, uh, you want to put this thing behind iron, iron bars. You don't want anyone getting in there. Um, if someone can compromise the KDC, they hose your entire security model. Um, so uh, a user in Kerberos uh, parlance is called a principal. A uh, principal is composed of three components. Uh, a instant, uh, primary, uh, the first part there is uh, some uh, logical name. For me, it might be Josh. Um, uh, slash instance, which is an optional sort of thing. Typically, what this corresponds to is like a host name or something like that. And a realm. So a realm is some logical unit, some business organization, something like that. Um, uh, typically, what you'll see with you know a human, you'd have something like this. You know, Elsa J. Hortonworks might be what I would use at work to authenticate myself to some um, internal uh, uh, services or things that my company runs. A service would have some you know logical name, so saying Accumulo, and then it has some fully qualified domain name that has is a tablet server at some you know at some domain, but it's also still in the Hortonworks realm. Um, and the first sort of distinction here is to notice that. Um, the primary loan is not uh, significant. Um, the, so these two sort of uh, uh, principles here at the bottom, l j at Hortonworks, compared to l j slash log and blah, 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 these are actually distinct uh, in terms of Kerberos. So uh, the basic model of how this is sort of works uh, Kerberos is a one-to-one -one sort of authentication scheme. So typically you would have a client which is going to talk to some service. Um, to do this, the client talks to the KDC first. It says, this is who I am. It provides its shared secret to say, hey, I am, I am Elser J. I am this client. The KDC is, okay, here you go. Here's your uh, cryptographically secure ticket. So this is our, our little uh, authentication bit which lets us talk to this, uh, our server then, which is authenticating over Kerberos. Um, there are two ways that you acquire this ticket. Uh, the most common one would be a password. So as you know, we're sitting at an interactive terminal, we go, we, we run a command to talk to the KDC and say, hey, give me a ticket, here's my password. KD says, okay. KDC says, yep, I see your password is okay, here's a ticket. And then the client can go and talk to whatever service it wants to. On the back end, the server can then also talk back to the KDC, do whatever, whatever is necessary there and say, yep, this client is who they say they are. Uh, when we're talking about services here, things that are not uh, sitting at an interactive terminal, so uh, you know, a tablet server, the uh, Cumulo daemons, Hadoop daemons, stuff like this, we don't want to have to enter a password on the console every time we start the system. So we have this notion of a key tab, which is a file that's just a non-plain text password form. So you know, this is typically some file sitting on disk. Um, you protect it like you would anything else. You want to make sure that only the user or only the service who uh, should be acting as this user can read it. Um, don't make it global readable, uh, globally readable because you have no security then. Uh, so uh, as an administrator accessing the system, you pretty much your entry point would be kadmin. Um, kadmin is just an interactive console to say, um, to interact with the KDC and manipulate that client database. So how do you add a principal to the system? How do you generate, how do you set the password? How do you generate a key tab? All this sort of stuff is set through there, including things like how long is a ticket lifetime valid for? Um, how long can a user with a valid ticket renew that ticket? Um, uh, these sorts of things. For most people using this system, interacting with Kerberos, they use the command line tool called knit. Uh, so knit is that tool that I was talking about in the last slide where we say this is how a client would authenticate with a KDC and say, please give me a ticket, I am this person. Um, the uh, output of the knit command is typically writing to a file on disk, which we refer to as a ticket cache. Uh, by default, it puts it in temp with a uh, little unique identifier there based on your UID. So you'd see it's something, if my uh, user ID was 500, you'd see some file temp kerb 5 cc underscore 500, um, it would be uh, only readable by my local Unix user, so no one else can come across and reuse that ticket cache. Um, that's just a convention sort of thing. You can, it's just a plain text file, you can put it wherever you'd like. Um, whether you're using knit to obtain a ticket cache via, or a ticket via a key tab or a password is analogous. They both uh, can go and be loaded into a ticket cache like this. And you can actually populate multiple tickets within one cache. So if you have multiple identities for a client, you talk to different servers and have different credentials, you can throw them all in one there. And finally, KList will just 
tells you what's actually in your ticket cache. <coughs> so the, the big question of, you know, why do we care about Kerberos when we're talking about Accumulo now? Or, you know, we have some distributed system here. Why, why can't I just use a username and password? Um, and it turns out uh, it's really hard once we have this uh, a large network of servers. Um, even when you say, I trust the network that my servers are sitting in. You know, you can say, I, I know that I have some system administrators who are managing this network. I know we have security checks. I know that my servers are sitting in a uh, cornered off room with a lock and key on it. No one else is getting in here. Um, not everyone even and starts at that point. Some people are, you know, with the move now into the public infrastructure, uh, you can start saying, if I'm running five nodes in EC2, do I trust EC2 enough to actually say that my nodes are secure from anyone else? Can anyone else see the network traffic going across my system? Um, and it turns out that's really hard, right? We want to, so um, the, one of the common things you'll see in security here is that uh, you should rarely ever reinvent some system. So the, the ideal goal here is um, someone else can do this much better than anyone else that any of the Accumulo developers can do off the cuff. Um, so let's go in and use that, and we'll get some other perks along the line. Um, Kerberos itself, um, um, specifically in Hadoop, you know, coming from the old Yahoo days, um, was uh, they were one of the really big players in actually bringing Kerberos authentication into Hadoop to start. And the, uh, the interesting part there is that they actually had a case where, you know, they had a secure network, they had a secure set of clusters, but they didn't trust their users enough. So they actually wanted to say, uh, the, one of their goals was saying, how do I prevent some malicious Yahoo employee from actually going and doing something, seeing some data that they're not supposed to see? How do we make sure that uh, this one user is uh, cryptographically uh, unable to go and access some data or do run some job, do something that they shouldn't be allowed to do? So the insider threat sort of notion. Um, and that's one of the uh, really nice things that Kerberos actually brings in. We can do this authentication, and we can be confident that um, we have that a user who says they are this user, we can be very certain that they are actually that user. And that's really, uh, really nice. We don't have to worry about a lot of um, crazy encryption things. We don't need to set up a lot of other work. Kerberos provides this for us out of the box. Um, and we didn't, typically you rarely have to write any code to actually get this. Um, another perk of this is that is uh, uh, when we bring this into sort of the Hadoop stack, it's actually become this sort of standard feature now across all the ecosystems. So once Hadoop kind of said, hey, we're standardizing on this, we're going to provide some APIs, you know, they, they coined this notion of unsecure and secure. So the unsecure is, you know, Wild West, you can say you are whoever you are. Um, but then once we get into the secure Kerberos mode, um, suddenly this causes downstream filter where pretty much every other project that runs with or integrates on Hadoop has some sort of Kerberos-based authentication model. So it actually turns into this sort of almost like a single sign-on notion. So Kerberos is really nice now that it's very prevalent in this ecosystem. Um, you don't have to worry about how do I authenticate to system A, how do I th authenticate to system B, uh, you know, what are these caveats? It's always just Kerberos. You have one uh, form of authentication, your ticket, and that's all you need. Uh, certain places which have some presence on Windows, you'll also see integration with Active Directory. Uh, you can set up Kerberos to, um, instead of just always going to the KDC to uh, uh, serve some authentication request, uh, you can uh, can uh, set up what's called like a cross-realm trust, where you know you might have some authentic, uh, some principles or some uh, credentials sitting in the KDC. You might have some sitting in Active Directory, but you can still always use K uh, Kerberos and the standard KNet as the means to obtain a ticket. Um, so you're setting up trust between the KDC and some Active Directory server, so you can have things like. Um, you can create a domain user on the Windows side, and you could have someone on the Linux side go and authenticate and just pull from that uh, single uh, login base, which for certain people is very nice. Other people, they're like, hey, I'm not running Windows. So, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of promise is this, right? It's, you know, we, we run our Knet, we get a ticket, we enter our password, and, you know, we, we wrote our, our analytics job, we run our, like, ETL task, whatever, we... We run it, it just picks up our authentication from the, the ticket cache we have on disk, it knows exactly who we are, and it's great, and we go home. We, we, you know, we get a coffee and we don't think about it. Um, and that's, that's rarely ever actually the case. Um, the the uh, 
Uh, I'm kind of sad. HBase has a really great error message that actually just says, uh, uh, consider KNet, which I think is just the ultimate slap in the face. So uh, Cumulo is doing a little bit better here. It doesn't actually like, kick you in the shins when your authentication doesn't actually work. But you know, when you're looking at this, like this is actually not that far off. This is the, a legitimate error message you would see. And as a user, we, we kind of look at this and we're like, uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, I was trying to authenticate. You know, it's doing Kerberos. Um, I don't know what a GSS is. Um, uh, mechanism level, like, uh, yeah. And so, and the problem is, you know, well, like, where do I go with this? You know, what do I, what do I do next? What, what do I even search for to say, how, how do I fix this? Right. And and, th and th like, there is some truth to this. Like, this is how. This is the kind of questions I'd see from people where they come up to me and say, like. Hey, I, I tried to run this job and it doesn't work. And and I'd be like, okay, well, can you tell me something about what you're trying to do? I'm like, uh, we're trying to run the job. Yeah. Okay. So, um, anyways. So let let's sort of start. You know, uh, we we sort of laid the groundwork here. So, you know, what is Kerberos? How does authentication work? How does how does a client uh, 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 obtain the credentials to talk to a server? So let's sort of bring Java into the mix now, right? So, ooh, I missed a, I missed a, missed a search and replace, shame on me. Um, so normally when we're talking about Java applications here, you know, um, the tool, whatever we're going to, we're going to run, you know, a Cumulo shell, HDFS login, um, some yarn command or something, the typical place is going to look is to say, it's going to say, if I'm not configured otherwise, I'm going to see, do you have a ticket cache when I know I'm configured to use Kerberos authentication? So this is that, that promise here. Things are primarily transparent, where we're just pulling something off disk. There's a canonical location that everybody knows. This is where the credentials will be if they're going to be there. And it just happens transparently. And we don't, you know, most times, we don't have to know it's going to be there. Um, so like I was saying earlier with Hadoop, you know, they were this longtime user of this. What they tried to do is build some API on top of this, which is uh, uh, referred to as user group information. This is the name of a Java class. Um, so you'll see this referred to a lot, or uh, just shortened down to UGI. Um, and they provide two methods here, um, which are uh, essentially let you say, I'm going to log in with a key tab. This is my principal. This is the path to the file on the local disk. Pretty trivial. Um, there's a, another variant here, which um, uh, returns you back an actual object, which lets you do things that are a bit more like the Jazz APIs, which we'll cover in a little bit. Um, the user group information class was primarily meant to be a syntactic sugar on top of the Jazz APIs, which are provided to you from the JDK itself. Um, these, um, it's questionable whether they're actually helpful. Um, sometimes they are, sometimes they just get in the way and make things worse. Um, but essentially under the hood, what's actually happening is when you use UGI or just Jazz directly, um, you're uh, creating something called uh, this Java X subject, uh, which contains your identity and the, you know, the cryptographically secure bits. Um, those are passed to this implementation called the KRB5 login module. So you know, your Oracle JDK has an implementation of this. You know, IBM would have a different implementation of the KRB5 login module. But this is what can actually go and speak the can speak Kerberos to the KDC and knows how to say, okay, here's his credentials, this is how we're gonna get a ticket. Um, Jazz itself has the ability, you can specify a configuration file, which is enough to sort of bootstrap uh, the uh, login to happen for you. So this is actually pretty neat. The um, only project in the, in the realm that I'm aware of that does this well is actually Zookeeper. So you can specify a configuration file for Zookeeper, and what actually happens is it transparently goes when it first tries to authenticate. If Zookeeper says, oh, I need to get some authentication to talk to the Zookeeper server, it can actually go pull from the Jazz subsystem, perform the login for you automatically, and kick you right over. It's actually quite nice when it works well. Um, if it were me going back in uh, 2009, 2008, whenever this was, I, I would have pushed a little harder for that because it's definitely much um, easier to have a certain place, everything going through Jazz. But now we're in this weird sort of funky, certain times we use Jazz explicitly, sometimes we use um, user group information. It's, it's kind of a mess. But under the hood, we're all, you know, we're all still speaking Kerberos here. It's just which level of abstraction is being used. So for Cumulo specific now, you know, we have um, tablet servers and we have the master tracer GC monitor. You know? How do those services get their ticket? How do they know how to authenticate? 
So what happens on, um, for Cumulo as well as any sort of long list service is that they have some key tabs stored on disk, um, which they are configured to point at and they say, I know this is my principal, I know there should be a, uh, an element in this key tab that I can go and use to log in. So typically there'll be a certain, you know, a line or two of code and any, any sort of daemon that you're running, which can go and perform the login based on the key tab. That gets a ticket and holds it in memory, and then for any sort of authentication requests or anything that the uh, service itself needs, it can go and access that either through Jazz or UGI, same sort of thing. Um, Accumulo, a sort of a, a thing that we hadn't quite implemented yet, um, is that we could actually use uh, uh, SASL-based authentication, so we could do Kerberos authentication with Zookeeper um, as a, a higher level of trust than what we do now. Um, because Accumulo had existed for such a long time without um, proper Kerberos support inside of it, um, we, uh, Accumulo actually built their own sort of way to get around this. So how do you, how did, um, when Accumulo didn't have Kerberos support, how does the data we put in Zookeeper secure? How do we make sure that other people can't modify this? Um, so uh, Zookeeper provides a number of, um, I forget the name they use, might not be mechanism, but different way that you can protect data in Zookeeper. One of them is Digest, which is just having some hashing of a password. So if you know the secret key, you can go and you can read write data in Zookeeper. Um, so you know the, um, it's based off of the instant secret uh, for Accumulo. Um, one of the things we could potentially do down the road is we could actually get rid of this functionality. We can, um, if you're in a realm where you know you have Kerberos working, you can just use the SASL authentication mechanism and we could actually do away with this need for a shared secret. Um, the irony there is that actually some of the stuff that the um, Accumulo shared secret, the instant secret property is meant to solve would actually be implicitly handled by Kerberos. Um, one of the biggest misnomers that I hear from people over and over again is that they say, okay, I had my service running and I came in the next day and it was dead. And I see these errors about, you know, unable to find TGT. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, how long was it running? And they say, well, it, it, it ran for like 23 or 24 hours. I'm like, mm-hmm. So um, when you attain a ticket from Kerberos, there's a lifetime on that ticket. So and by default, guess, guess what? It's 24 hours. Um, so the interesting part is, you know, you might say like, okay, well, how do I have a service that runs indefinitely then? I, I need my service to not have to be restarted every single day because I want a day off on the weekend that, at a very minimum. Um, so you can have this notion of anytime you have a ticket which is still valid, um, within a certain window you can go back to the KDC and say, hey, you know, I had a previous uh, ticket here that said I'm Josh. Um, I'd like to get a new one that has a new uh, validity date for another 24 hours. And KDC says, okay, yep, I know I assigned this ticket to you before, let me give you a new one that's valid for another 24 hours. Um, so how this is meant to work in the system is that um, any service that is long lived like this would be automatically doing this in the background for you. Say so it would check intrinsically and say, okay, I see my ticket is valid for 24 hours, I see that I still have another 12 hours left in the lifetime, I don't need to do a renewal yet. When you get down to like the last, you know, three or four hours, the service would start checking, say, okay, I need to do a, you know, let me try to do a renewal, um, stuff like that. Um, anyone who tells you that they need to do a K init minus R to try to renew on the command line, um, just, just stop listening to them because they don't actually know what they're talking about. So that would be uh, refreshing the ticket cache on disk with the hopes that somehow the, the service, which wasn't using the ticket cache to begin with, it was using a key tab, was magically going to pick it up out of that file on disk and suddenly fix all the problems. Um, usually it's coming up with, I did this and it didn't work, why? Well, yeah. So uh, clients. So you know we have our services running. Um, they're uh, using their key tabs to authenticate. They're uh, refreshing them periodically. How do how do our clients access the system? Most of the time, you know, when we're doing interactive things, so if you're launching a shell, if you're doing something like that, you're going to use a ticket cache just because it's there on the system. Um, you don't really have to know about. It. You don't have to do anything special. When you start getting into place where you're automating tasks, you have some sort of workflow set up where you're running um, some chain of MapReduce jobs, for example, maybe you're doing some sort of um, data munging, something like this, you'd have some sort of key tab in which you can go, you have it on disk, you have it secured, and you can just put these entries in cron tab, and you can say, okay, these things are going to run in sequence, and they're going to authenticate using a key tab. 
So clients can sort of go both ways. Sometimes we're just doing interactive sort of things where we pull from a ticket cache. Other times we want to pull from a key tab because we're, we're not doing these interactively. We're doing them in the background. For the same reason that servers have to renew their tickets, clients also have to renew their tickets if they need to. So if you had some sort of um, a large processing task or some all those on sort of thing, maybe you're running a bolt and storm, um, doing some like Spark streaming sort of thing, it's the same sort of notion. You still have to go and renew your ticket if you're um, doing that. You know, there is no mechanism that automatically starts that and does it for you in most cases. Uh, you know, if you think back to the earlier slide, there are a number of ways you can do this. You can do it via Jazz, you can do it via UGI. Typically, UGI is going to be the most pr um, prevalent way to do this in our, you know, hadoop -y ecosystem here. But in theory, any of the previous ways we've mentioned would be fine to work. So there's a couple things. Um, so I mentioned earlier about how UGI is a little hokey sometimes. Um, the things that they tried to do, that the earlier Hadoop developers tried to do on top of Jazz was have, to th have this notion of saying, who is the current user? Jazz doesn't have this notion. What they say is, um, here are some credentials, and then when you specify some task or you invoke some method which knows that this is the, um, there's a logical name. So it says, you know, when there is a, uh, a task running that needs to get the Accumulo client's um, authentication, you know, Jazz can go and wire up and automatically run some command with that Accumulo client's credentials. Um, but most people using it don't quite understand that there is this level of distinction. Most people just have one uh, set of credentials. You know, I'm me. I don't have multiple things I need to wrangle in one JVM. I just have mine, and please just work. So what UGI tries to do is they try to have this notion of a global state. So when you invoke this first, me first method, login user from key tab, it doesn't return you anything. It just actually sets some static state inside its class, which then all the rest of the Hadoop ecosystem that uses user, user group information can go and pull from. And it sort of shoehorns itself in a little bit earlier than what would normally have happened with Jazz. Um, the latter method here uh, would only be relevant when you have to service um, uh, when you have to handle multiple different credentials in one single JVM. So you need to actually have this context. You'd see um, there's a method known as do as. So if you see people talking in this context, so they're saying, well, I did a do as this. What they actually mean here is I'm invoking the do as method on a user group information object, which is going to isolate whatever tasks that's running will specifically use the credentials identified by that UGI object. So that if I have some uh, credentials, you know, I need to run this one query as Josh. I'm going to go, I'm going to get a UGI for Josh. I'm going to do a do as for that. If at the same time in another thread I have some uh, query I need to run as Gary, I'm going to get a UGI for Gary. And I'm going to go do as and run that query as Gary. So that provides us our separation that we can handle these concurrently and safely. Um, in the context of Accumulo, there is this, uh, we have our authentication token API, which introduced like 1.6, 1.7, something like that. Um, and this notion was meant, or this API was meant to abstract away um, specifically for Accumulo logins, what are the variety of sources that it, it accepts. There's a Kerberos token one which uses these user group information APIs and um, it tries to do some of this magic for you, but it's better to just sort of know what it's doing and you can write that up in your application yourself. You don't have to rely on some um, side effects from calling some method. <sighs> Still with me? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so now we're going to go another level deeper, right? So we're talking about, so we've covered now Kerberos. We've covered um, how do Java applications do Kerberos. And we've said, you know, how do we do in the context, the context of Accumulo and Hadoop, how do they do Kerberos logins, right? But we haven't really said, you know, okay, how, does, how do we actually get credentials from the client to the server? How do we, how do, we do that part, right? That, we sort of glossed over that originally saying, oh, we have a ticket and it just magically, the data just flows. Like we don't really know how it happens, but it does. Um, so in practice, how this typically happens is um, based on using this framework called SASL. Um, so SASL is also one of these really obtuse things when you first look at it, and it's a authentication framework. It doesn't actually, uh, define anything off the cuff. It's just saying like this is a general uh, uh, API that um, implementations can, uh, or certain authentication uh, protocols can implement 
to speak um, their authentication over some abstract RPC. So really what that means is saying, when you have some sort of problem where you want a computer A talking to computer B, um, regardless of how that, that data is actually flowing between the two, so regardless of the transport, what is a common API that we can use so that regardless of the authentication you're using, we have one API. So if you have client uh, you know, A talking to B uh, and you want to do Kerberos, you can use SASL and then you know, A to B uses SASL and it authenticates over Kerberos and it's great. But you know, down the road, say you want to implement some sort of simple password-based authentication for some legacy use case or something. You don't have to rewrite all of your RPC anymore because you can merely plug in, I'm going to do simple password authentication and I'm going to do Kerberos authentication. That all plugs right into SASL as the library for building that RPC language itself. So it's really nice in that regard. It's you know, just a specification that says this is what the protocol should do. And then you get things that uh, will go and implement SASL. So for example, Thrift inside of Accumulo will use SASL to implement Kerberos authentication, among other things. So um, when, now we're actually, when we talk about SASL speaking Kerberos, what that actually means is that we're using uh, what's referred to as GSS API. So GSS API is yet another framework which has the ability to speak Kerberos v5. So Kerberos v5 is the current one, and GSS API is yet another level of indirection which says, okay, this is how Kerberos can be implemented between uh, client and server. SASL implements GSS API, therefore SASL can speak Kerberos. It's a le level of indirection which is sort of one of these gotchas, but there's really not anything of consequence to it. Uh, the other important note here, which we'll cover in a little bit, is um, there's another mechanism to SASL, which is most commonly used in our realm, which is referred to as Digest MD5. Um, so this is very similar to that Digest uh, mechanism we were talking about earlier with Zookeeper. Again, it's just how do we take a simple password, how do we hash it, and use that for some authentication instead. Um, we'll talk about it a little bit more when we get there. The other bit that uh, SASL provides is uh, data security. So they build in the notion of how do we uh, actually protect um, the bits going over the wire, not necessarily just the authentication data. Um, by default, you're just getting authentication, but you can also pull up um, uh, integrity checking, so making sure that the contents of the data was not modified in transit, but you can also get uh, encryption working so that uh, no one can see the data in transit either. And there's commensurate um, performance penalties that you'd pay for that, you know. 5% for um, integrity checking and 15% you know, for encryption. Um, so touching a little bit on the um, trusted and untrusted world, um, or on, on an untrusted network rather, um, Kerberos, while it can do certain things on its own for doing this uh, distributed trust, you also have, it relies heavily on DNS. Um, so the, uh, let's just go to this here. Um, so in general, um, Kerberos, is Kerberos is relying on some names of a service to say, this service is who they say they are, this is the ticket for that service. Um, in a world where you have good DNS, you know, a client can say, I want to talk to server one, and it can go and talk to that server one, it sees that, okay, that server that I know as server one has a ticket for server one, great. I, I can be reasonably certain that it, it is who it says it is um, because um, naming as well as the ticket we receive. In a case where you actually can't trust your DNA, you can get into a situation that if some malicious service can spoof your DNS and say, trick you into thinking service one is actually somebody else, as long as they have a valid Kerberos key tab, you, would, you wouldn't actually know from a client side that it was invalid. So really when we're uh, deploying things on, uh, on a cluster here, uh, yes, we don't have to trust the network, but we really, really have to trust DNS. And like, uh, compared to both the KDC and um, uh, DNS servers, they are like a equivalent levels of you need to cover your butt with these. These are extremely important. These, if you're going to get an attack happening, it's going to be on one of these. Um, so the, the quick thing here, you know, this is one little thing I will, will do because it comes up over and over again. Use NS lookup, make sure forward and reverse work. It will break if you don't, if they don't. So, um, I've been doing this long way, so we'll skip that. So there are a couple edge cases that we should cover. Um, 
Uh, notably, how, do we, how does this all work when we have a yarn job, some distributed task that we're running, uh, as well as how, do we have, how does this work when we have some server that's running some operation on behalf of another user. Um, so MapReduce is obviously our one example. The other would be something like the Cumulo Thrift proxy server. How does this actually work when um, this server that's running here in, um, in, in the cloud or wherever um, doesn't have our credentials, but it can still talk to a Cumulo as an, a peer that is uh, as the end user. So delegation tokens building on that Digest MP5 stuff that we covered earlier. Um, this is just a, uh, a way, a fancy way of saying um, this is a short-lived password. Um, we can ask the system to generate a short-lived password. We can tell the rest of our system, our Cumulo nodes, hey, um, this user here is allowed to use this uh, short-lived password. Um, and we can then distribute that to some, like our yarn cluster, to use that for authentication instead of having to ship our key tab around. So because there is no, if you lose your key tab, if somehow yarn is compromised and someone gets a hold of your key tab, you're, you're screwed until you go and revoke everything very painful. Whereas if we just ship out this short-lived password, it's, it's still bad for a little bit, but it's much more constrained of a problem here. And again, this is really just, um, adding in another level of indirection instead of using your Kerberos credentials directly, there's another level uh, in between there that prevents you from having to actually ship those out. And finally, with the proxy user stuff, um, this is essentially saying now, um, we're using configuration to actually determine uh, whether a service is allowed to act on behalf of some end user. So if I have some um, server that's running queries for my users, um, I should know I can configure a Cumulo to say, hey, I know this specific server running on this host is actually allowed to execute things as other users. Whereas normally, this would be an error at the Kerberos level, right? If, if I came in and said, hey, I, I'm Gary, I want to run a query, you know, that, that should fail because no, I have a ticket for Josh, not Gary. So what this is really doing, both in the Cumulo as well as the Hadoop and everybody else, uh, they solve this via configuration um, property that can say, okay, I'm going to go and let this one server that I specifically identify is allowed to run things as other users. And same thing. Uh, one last bit is about Spinego. Um, it doesn't exist in, Kerber, uh, in Accumulo yet. Uh, this would be something that we could actually secure the web UIs. Not really much more to say other than um, Spinego is using um, or enables Kerberos authentication over an HTTP transport. Um, standard in your Jetty libraries, whatever you're going to pull off the shelf, um, but not yet in Cumulo. So, uh, finally, some just if you do ever find yourself coming back to this, um, some little things to check for. Um, make sure you have current versions of all the software. There have been bugs around this stuff. Uh, make sure you have the Java crypto extensions installed because you will need them for um, the weak keys that come in the default installation don't work. Um, Enable some debug or trace logging because they actually will give you helpful messages. Um, there's also Java level uh, debug you can enable via system property, which is also very helpful. And remember that DNS is uh, a cornerstone. If you have invalid DNS entries on certain nodes, you will see things like some nodes can authenticate and, some, and others cannot. Um, so always be checking, uh, read very closely all the logs, look at host names, look at um, principal names. Um, Make sure you always have an understanding what is an authentication error, what is an authorization error. So, you know, again, like we were saying, if, we, if you see an authorization error, it's not a Kerberos problem because Kerberos is only doing the authentication. And finally, read, read the logs. Please, just, just read them. Um, there's some other uh, ancillary stuff here, uh, documentation from people in the community, people outside of the community. Um, and there is ability to run tests, so, you know, it's not an excuse to say, I don't know if this works on Kerberos. You can actually write tests that will go and uh, use Kerberos in, uh, in a unit test environment. And that's it. So there would be no distinction between, as it is right now, there would just not be a distinction between um, tablet servers if they were using the same. So if you have three tablet servers running on one single host, there's no reason that they couldn't all use the same principle in key tab. They wouldn't necessarily have to have unique um, credentials. Uh, yes, I mean, I, I've run multiple tablet servers on it, or, you know. Yeah, that, that does not, that is not a concern. There are ways you can do fancier things with DNS, and 
uh, authentication, but that really gets down the implementation. Anything else? Well, thank you for surviving the talk for most of you. I think the room is about the same size. All right, thank you, everyone. <laughs>